people have said to me for a while, you must record your Monteverdi Vespers. And I thought, oh, how many commercial recordings are there of the Monteverdi Vespers? I'm sure I'd add something to it, but there's so much other interesting music out there. The thing about Gabrielli isn't, isn't so much the individual parts, it's the collection of them and the smaller things that all, then all come together in this extraordinary kind of um, luxuriant sound and that is definitely, he's got that spot on I think. So we started talking, Hugh Keaton and I, about Magnificats. And I know a lovely three-choir Magnificat by Gabrielli that I'd done, but it's been recorded. And Hugh said, well, there is a Magnificat for 20 and 28 voices that no one's ever done because only eight of those 28 parts still exist. Because music was printed not in full score, but in part books. And only part books for eight of those parts exist. Maritans. talked about the, the, the Gabrielli Magnificat, which I'd started doing 15 years before, given up, discouraged, nobody wanted to do it, I couldn't think it could be completed. And he just encouraged me to do it, and when I, when I got discouraged writing it, he just wouldn't let me stop. Hugh says that as if it's easy, but that little bit, bom 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 bom, that's all there is, out of which you extrapolate all this feeding into it because that's clearly the very last thing to be sung in a little e echo passage. And to hear all around one a complete new creation that sounds, I mean, absolutely true to me. There's so much fantastic music making going on in Venice, in Germany, in Vienna, and so, and so much it was on a really grand scale. The slightly um, contentious thing that you've done, which I find imaginative but right, is this fanfare in the middle. Tell us why you've put that in. Well, it gradually became obvious to me in the 15 years I've been sort of peering at this that the, that the whole thing was very angry and all the belligerent warlike things in, in Magnificat text were being emphasised enormously. So yeah. to me, they get more and more gleeful. They, they're actually doing that. Yeah, yeah. So on top of this... To, to our forefathers. On top of this, at the full setting of those words, si could lo cultus yes. you have this very brass-like... A couple of years back, I did a BBC radio programme looking at multi-choir music, Italian, polychoral music from the late 16th, early 17th century. I heard afterwards from, from Hugh Keat, and he said there was only one thing that I, that I didn't quite get right, that in fact, Gabrielli's motet in Ecclesis, which is for four solo voices, a chorus, and six obligata, six separate instrumental groups, was in fact only a short score. It was a reduced version published after Gabrielli's death in 1615. So I encouraged Hugh to do a larger version for us, which is what we're going to be recording today. So instead of those rather empty bits when two solo voices call across to each other, you now have two banks of choirs and instruments singing across to each other, which just instinctively feels more right. The new boy on this disc is Lodovico Viadana. Contemporary Monteverdi's, they both worked at Mantua. And in 1612, the year of Gabriele's death, he published a large-scale collection of Vespers psalms. <laughs> The unusual thing about this collection, when you look at it first of all, you think that's for four choirs, well that's quite grand, but when you look rather more closely, you see that the top choir is a choir of five soloists. The second choir is a chorus. The third and fourth choirs are complementary choirs. But the really revolutionary thing is the way that he's writing for soloists answered by choir in the way that, you think of Mozart writing a piano concerto, it's a dialogue between the two of them. Yeah. 
Monteverdi's Vespers, he doesn't do it in the same way. Monteverdi's fabulous 1610 Vespers from just two years before this, he integrates the two. Whereas in this, it's a constant conversation and we're finding it to be very hyper expressive music, really interested in the individual detail of the words. The thing that obsesses me is line. It's that beginning a phrase, taking it through the middle so that the end of it is inevitable. If you just hear a series of chords, which is very tempting in music this grand and big just to listen to the noise it makes, you know, chords, schmords, who cares? It's the line through it. If you listen to a pianist playing Chopin, it's the way he gets through to the end of a phrase. It's his shaping, his turning of the phrase that's interesting. Imagine a man walking and then a film of the same speed of a man running in slow motion. They're going at the same distance, but you can clearly tell that the man in slow motion is off the ground and he has a wider span to his movement. And that's, that's what we need, it's that span of movement.